everyone. I would like to welcome you to today's online conversation, The Impact of COVID-19 on the Restaurant Business. Start your engines. We kindly request that your microphones be muted during the presentation. All questions will be addressed at the end of the program in our Q&A. We welcome your inquiries and comments in the chat box. Uh, so now, allow me to introduce our president of the Hellenic American Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Marcos Dracotos. Hi, welcome everyone. Um, Hi, Marcos. I, I'd like to welcome everyone Hi, to start your engines. Uh, this topic is so very important as the restaurant industry has been virtually crippled by the pandemic and the government of New York's response to it. So many businesses have been shuttered and or paralyzed, hurting countless amounts of restaurant owners, employees, suppliers, and their families. We hope that, the that today's event at the very least offers some guidance to people in the industry or food for thought on how to navigate through it. I'd like to thank our panelists, Mr. Steve Tenevios, Fresh & Co., Mr. Nick Livanos, Livanos Restaurant Group, Mr. Alexander Aldo, Chef's Warehouse, and Mr. Aristoteles Cartulliaris, Victory Food Service, for participating and discussing with us the restaurant business from an operation and supply side standpoint in the age of COVID. I'd also like to thank Mr. Dimitris Kafitsas, President Pan Gregorians, for the vital role they play in representing the Greek uh, food industry all these years. Lastly, we have the regrets of both Dr. Kutras, Consul General of Greece, who had an EU meeting, and Trade Minister Michaelidis, whose flight was canceled yesterday from Greece and is now in mid-flight returning to New York. I'd also like to thank our sponsors, John Stratakis, Paul Stublin, Nancy Papayuani, Atlantic Bank, Nick Gatsanos, Seward and Kissel, Mr. Clay Maitland, Marshall Island Registries in Neymar, Atas Iwanu, Northern Rose and Southern Star. The hack operates off of donations and our sponsors play a vital role in ensuring that we're able to bring to you wonderful programs such as Start Your Engines. Please note that on September 16th, Hack is the lead sponsor for a joint virtual session with all the European chambers featuring the ambassador of the EU to the US, Mr. Stavros Lambrinidis. One of Hack's main goals is to work with as many Greek organizations as possible. We believe that if we all cooperate, we will not only strengthen the Greek community, but better help promote our Greek businesses and industries. I'd like to now ask Mr. Kapitsas to make a few remarks on behalf of the Pangregorians. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Dragotos. Gentlemen, ladies, uh, the restaurant industry uh, is among the uh, hardest hit during the uh, pandemic. The revenues for the majority of restaurants that still operate under the imposed caution mandates have been as low as 75% less for quarter two over last year's same time. For those who may not uh, operate indoors or do not have the capacity for delivery or outdoors dining, the situation is more dire as they wonder how long they can stay in business while not being able to open and have uh, to pay rent. There are no answers here, just uh, innovative ideas. And this costs money that the independent operator is not always able to spend under the circumstances. Large restaurant groups that may implement economies of scale have a better chance of survival. Shutting doors has already happened to some restaurants and will happen to many more. The Greek American community shares a large percentage of this New York City restaurant industry. Out of the uh, 26,000 restaurants, more than 10,000 are still closed and the rest operate in survival mode outdoors and until the weather permits. As such, the economic impact and the financial success of the Greek American restaurant operators follows the fate of the industry. What is next and how we cope? It all depends on regulation, compliance, and of course the intensely awaited for vaccine. Yet New York City is the mecca of going out and the restaurants have long been a major attraction point. With these closed and with them, 
The rest of nightlife and family entertainment, visiting or living in New York City has become less appealing with negative effects in the value of real estate and consumer spending. The industry must adapt and overcome the challenges of COVID-19. And we're here to discuss how. Thank you for allowing me to state my thoughts, Mr. President. Ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. And we appreciate everything that you do for the Greek food industry. Um, I'd like to now invite our moderator, uh, Vice President of the Hellenic American Chamber of Commerce, um, Mr. Nick Katsanos, to open up the discussion. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Nick. Um, I'm a partner at the law firm of Seward & Kissel, and as uh, Marcos just said, I'm on the board and Vice President of the Hellenic American Chamber of Commerce. Um, uh, I just want to get it out there and just say that I personally am not a member of the restaurant industry, but um, my family, I, I come from a family of restaurant owners. And so this topic is very near and dear to my heart. Um, you know, my, my family's story is a very typical Greek immigrant story. They immigrated here to New York City back in the early 70s and they've been in restaurants ever since. My father, my, my brother, my uncles, my cousins, friends, even my father-in-law, who's not even Greek, all in the restaurant industry. Um, my father and my uncle still run one of the oldest diners in Manhattan on 58th Street and 9th Avenue called The Flame, which is almost 50 years old. And really, it, even now we're in August and I still remember this time of year before school started, my father would wake me up in the morning and, uh, and bring me to work, probably violating all sorts of child labor laws and having me, you know, bus tables and go on deliveries. And so I feel as if restaurants are, are still in my DNA, even though I'm not in, involved in the industry on a day-to-day -day basis. So watching what's happened to the restaurant industry over the last six months has really pained me, you know, to see what the pandemic has done and how it's changed our lives. Now, just to give you a, you know, a little bit of perspective, I just wanted to go over a few recent facts that have been published in, in, in the New York Times about, at least in the New York City restaurant industry, and it applies to other areas in the suburbs and the other, you know, other parts of the tri-state area, just to give you a sense of how bad it's been. So fewer than half of the city's eateries have reopened since the spring. More than half of the roughly 300,000 workers in the industry are on unemployment. And I think that's probably under, under counting how many workers we're actually talking about. New York City restaurants have been doing anywhere between 10 to 25% of last year's volume, which is horrific. And at least 1,300 restaurants have closed permanently between March and July. Now, these are horrible statistics. Um, and this is only New York City. So when we first scheduled this event, I think we were expecting that restaurants would be in a much better place and they'd be you know, planning to reopen in full or close to being in full. And we'd be talking about those preparations. And instead we find the restaurants really in a state of limbo, in particular in New York City and, and New Jersey, although there was a sliver of a little bit better news today from New Jersey, which we can talk about in a bit. Um, despite that negativity though, there are some lights at the end of the tunnel, it seems. And, you know, we have a great panel today to talk to us about all of these things, and I'll let each one of them introduce themselves, uh, you know, before we, we jump into things. So maybe what we'll do is, Steve, um, you could introduce yourself first and, and talk about your background, and then we'll move to Nick, and then Alexandros, and then Aristoteles, and then I'll throw out a question, and then we'll go from there. We'll have a conversation. I mean, we can if anyone disagrees or agrees with anything being said or wants to add anything, feel free to jump in. I think it'll be more fun for the audience and for us. And uh, hopefully we won't say anything to get ourselves in trouble. So with that, Steve, I don't know if you want to kick it off and then Nick. Can sure. Start. Be my pleasure. Uh, I'm Steve Tenedios, uh, together with my son, owner of Fresh & Co., Fresh & Company here in the city. We have 19 locations. Um, mostly Midtown Manhattan. Uh, one is in Yonkers, New York. Uh, we have another brand called Cafe Metro. And I'm also partners in two Greek restaurants. Uh, one is Kima on 18th and the other one is Elea on 85th and Broadway. 
so a pretty wide spectrum of uh, of restaurants um, and both quick casual and full serve to uh, to get results from um, I started in the business at sixteen and have gone through several cycles economical um, different different types of cycles here in the city. This certainly and, and by far is the worst that, that any of us could have imagined. And the impact on business has been just devastating. Um, your numbers that you were quoting, Nick, were, um, were pretty spot on. Uh, we're between 12 and 20% in the quick casual and a little bit north of, uh, of 25% in the full serve. Um, as you know, uh, this business can't sustain those type, types of volumes. Um, I'm not paying rent in any of my 33 locations. If I was, I'd be out of business already. We just shuttered today a Cafe Metro location, handed back the keys. Um, and it's looking like another three or four locations between the, uh, the Metro and the Fresh & Co. brand will probably be closed by year's end. Um, no relief in sight. And, and what I mean by that is I have units that have been open now for four, four and a half months. Some, some of the metro stores uh, opened right after COVID, as soon as we were able to get the doors open again. Um, and the growth has really been abysmal. It's, it's been $100, $200, $300 a week. No no great movement upward to give encouragement or, or to give us hope. Um, and that's pretty much across the board. I, I really don't have any exceptions to that. The stores that are in the fringes of the city, Upper West Side and Upper East Side, one of each, quick casual and a full serve, seem to be doing better. Our Yonkers store, which is out of the, 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 the Midtown, uh, the, the New York City grid, um, also is, is doing pretty well. Uh, that's a, a, a deviant from the, uh, the rest of the stores as far as the, uh, the percentage increase or the percentage of sales compared to last year. Um, Midtown is decimated and anybody that comes to Midtown, like I've done for the last 45 years, is greatly saddened by what we see, which is not just closed restaurants, but it's all sorts of closed businesses. Um, a lot of homeless. Um, I actually don't feel safe for the first time, and I'm here since the, uh, the early 80s. I, I don't feel safe moving around my own city. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you, you've said a lot of things that I think um, a lot of people in the restaurant industry feel and, and have experienced so far. Um, and I'm sure we'll be talking, we'll be getting into more of all that in a bit. Um, Nick, do you want to uh, say a little bit about yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, Nick Livanos from the Livanos Restaurant Group. I am second generation, and my children are, have entered the business. So, so three of my four kids. My dad's still involved a little less lately. So we're, we have the unique uh, beauty of being three generations working together. We up to recently owned uh, six restaurants. We just closed one permanently because we had a very uncooperative landlord at 1700 Broad Broadway. We had a fast casual concept called Oceana Poke. Uh, the landlord would not budge on anything, so we, we closed. Um, out of the five restaurants, uh, the two in Westchester have been operating. We have City Limits Diner in White Plains and the Modern Barn in Armonk. And these two restaurants have outdoor dining and indoor dining. So we've been operating at about 40, 45% of our normal sales. In Manhattan, Molivos has not opened yet because of its location, Midtown, as Steve mentioned earlier, it's, Midtown is decimated. There's no business there. And on top of it, the problem that we have that we also share with Steve is 7th Avenue is going through a subway construction. So on top of it, the, the street is all dug up. So even if we wanted to do outdoor dining, we, we can't. Um, Oceana happens to be going through a renovation that was already scheduled on the books. Uh, so we've been renovating and it's 
basically complete and we plan to open mid-September for outdoor dining. Uh, we'll see what happens. I, I don't have high expectations, but we're going to do it. And Usia on 57th west of 11th happens to have a very wide sidewalk and we're doing decent business. Again, 35% of our normal sales. When it rains, we do nothing. But we have about 65 seats out there. And, and when the weather is nice, we'll do two full seatings. So it's something, but still, it's, it's like a slow death, if you, if you ask me. I mean, if, we, if indoor dining doesn't open up soon in Manhattan, uh, I don't know how much longer we'll be able to hold on to. Even with our PPP money, we're slowly burning through it. Um, we can't do what, what PPP is designed to be, is to hire back your staff to get the full forgiveness. So how that eventually plays out, it's still a, a wait and see for us. But it's, um, it doesn't look good. And, and for the whole industry, for every restaurateur that I speak to, uh, I, I don't see one person expressing anything optimistic. We're all, we're all in the same boat. Yeah. Uh, the only good thing I could say is my, my oldest son, Johnny, has pivoted slightly and he's introduced, uh, he's made a Greek wild gin called Stray Dog, coming from Greece. So we've actually uh, pivoted a little bit as a family because everyone's drinking and everyone is uh, <laughs> buying alcohol. So, and we're one of the few uh, uh, Greek gins coming out of Greece. So we've done something slightly um, diversified. But otherwise, we're, we're hanging in there and hoping for the best. Nick, you may have given us a new idea for the next uh, Zoom meeting, a gin tasting uh, event, maybe. I, uh, I, have, yes. I have one question. How do you call stray dog in, uh, in Greek? Is there a translation? <laughs> no, we're sticking to we, we, we try to capture the grittier <laughs> side of Greece. Um, so that's how, that's how Johnny think, came up with the name. I think it's a despoto, a despoto skilinik. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't sound good, though. Yeah. Straight yeah. Dog has a little more... A little more uh, appeal. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Alexander, so you're, you come from a different angle on all this. Maybe you can tell, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, uh, good evening. Thanks for... Uh, and good afternoon. Thanks for having me on the panel. Um, I serve as general counsel for the Chef's Warehouse, so it's a um, specialty distribution manufacturing company that's listed on the NASDAQ Stock Exchange and um, was family founded by the Pappas brothers, uh, who are, are still leading the company today and um, now is up to 30 operating companies in North America, U.S. and, and Canada. And so, um, you know, through... Through my work, I've had the opportunity to see a series of markets across, um, you know, both countries, and um, and the challenges that uh, that Nick and um, Steve were were talking about as well. Um, it just with respect to any comments from my perspective, given the public company nature, they'll need to be more industry and broad rather than specific to the company. But um, within those parameters, I'll, I'll do my best to you know, provide thoughtful insight to, to the industry. Okay. Thanks for that. And then Aristoteles. Uh, I want to say hello to everybody and uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, I have been in the state for about 11 years. I'm a part owner of the restaurant here in Astoria and I also work for a Victory Food Service in uh, as a salesperson and uh, in business development. Unfortunately, the pandemic has implemented all of us, and we can see it, especially in the city in Manhattan. But uh, beside that, from a salesperson uh, perspective, the pandemic obligated me to look alternative sides of uh, the business, to go and pursue different customers that um, outside of the city, mainly in Long Island, in Queens, in the Bronx, and in uh, Brooklyn. Some of the difficulties that I'm seeing uh, lately, the, especially the last week, and one of the concerns that a lot of restaurant owners have, it's the weather. As we're getting closer to autumn and to September and to October, 
people, they cannot stay outside us until four or nine o'clock in the night time. So that's going to be a new challenge for all the restaurants that they have the outside dining now as the weather is changing. Uh, beside that, in the food distribution, we have seen a lot of shortages in the market because, because, because a lot of companies like uh, food companies are not producing, even the meat companies, the produce companies, the Hellman's a few weeks ago said that it's going to stop uh, production for a few weeks because uh, they cannot uh, supply the whole demand. So I think everybody's are waiting to see what's going to come and what the mayor and the governor of New York is going to say and when they're going to open back. Hmm. Why, why do you think that, that's interesting, why do you think that uh, there are these issues with the supply chain? Is it because, the, you know, so many restaurants are closed, they're working at minimal capacity and, and therefore the supermarkets are, are getting a lot of that or what? Well, my perspective is that um, a lot of com companies, for example, meat plants, like uh, they have minimized the people that they work there mm -hmm. for security measures due to COVID. So yeah. instead of having working, you know, 100 people, now they're working 25 people because they have to keep social distancing and everything. Plus that a lot of uh, food companies, uh, they have uh, emphasized more in, uh, in the retail market, leaving the food service a little bit behind. Mm, interesting. I mean, Nick or Steve, I mean, have you seen any, have you had any issues with, with supplies? Uh, very, very little because very little supplies are, are needed at this <laughs> point. <laughs> Unfortunately, I shouldn't laugh, but yes. Yeah. 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 We have not, not had it. No. No, we maybe, have maybe not had a problem either. Yeah. Immediately after COVID, you know, uh, seafood was an issue. Um, certainly prices have moved upward. I, I have to say that, Nick. Yeah. Um, but, but really no shortages to speak of. Right. Right. Um, you know, we've talked a little bit about I mean, we, indoor dining got brought up. I mean, what do you, I, I think I know what the answer is going to be, but I mean, do you think the government's doing enough right now? I mean, they've, we had the PPP loans and those are, um, to the extent you got one, you've either probably already used it or it's been used up or it's about to be used up. Um, there's been some talk. I don't know if everyone's aware well, of that. I have, to, I have to correct you on that. that. That's not the case for my business. I, I don't know what it's like in uh, Nick's business. But mm -hmm. uh, I'm hoping that they extend the 24 weeks because we won't have a chance right. to spend that money. Um, right. And I take it back, even in the full serve restaurants, you know, we, we got a late start because of where we are and you really can't hit the gas. It's, it's almost counterproductive to bring in more people than you need. Right. Um, and we're also discovering now running lean and mean, if you will, we're discovering some new efficiencies. So, so we're seeing good food, good food cost, good labor cost, which helps stretch the dollar. Um, and just, you know, I, I think anybody that's in the restaurant business, uh, economia has been ingrained in us to, to such a point that, that we're right. reticent to spend the money foolishly or, or needlessly. Right. right. I and agree I, with Steve. Yeah. It, it's, it becomes counterintuitive to try to maintain a higher payroll just for the sake of getting forgiveness. It just goes against how, how we know how to operate. Mm -hmm. and, and and how we got where we like are Steve, we found right. yeah but we're, we're running things and more efficiently when business comes back i think in the long run uh we'll be even better operators but we just gotta certainly. get there certainly right, right. Yep. Mm -hmm. but but do you think that the government should be doing more right now because the um you know the there is some talk of something called a restaurant act uh, which has been sitting, I don't know if how many people know about this. It's been in Congress for the last month or two where they were about $120 billion of aid for restaurants. Um, you know, who knows if that'll ever get passed, but you know, we have the indoor dining debacle right now in, in New York city and New Jersey finally is allowing indoor dining uh, at least a 25% capacity as of, you know, they announced that today. I mean, what, it, from your perspectives, I mean, what, is, what do you think the government should be doing, if anything? 
Well, if, if I could say about regarding the 50% capacity that we have in Westchester, yeah, we never come close to it. The majority of the, of the public still wants to eat outside. Right. So we, I would say at best we're 25, 30%. So even I, 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 I recently wrote a, wrote a letter to Governor Cuomo stating that as restaurateurs, we know how to uh, control our insides. Like let us open up, let us, be at, at up to 50% capacity, but the demand won't be there. Mm -hmm. So that, that needs to happen. Um, and we, because we have bigger restaurants, it'd be that much easier for us to manage the interior. What I wish government would do more is make the forgiveness easier. Uh, all, these, all these hoops that we've got to jump through, uh, and it's, it's quite complicated. They should at least be doing that for us. Uh, Nick, um, could I make one comment on that? Yes, go ahead. Um, so from a uh, distributor perspective, we're, we're part of an organization called the International Food Service Distributors Association. Mm -hmm. And um, our main focus has been um, supporting the restaurants. So we've not, uh, so we, we did not uh, seek or secure PPP money for for our company feeling like, uh, you know, that would be better allocated to the restaurants. But the, uh, the main industry initiatives has, have uh, been focused on a bipartisan basis on doing more for our customers, um, the, the important uh, restaurateurs across, uh, across the US. So it's, it's, um, that's been the main thrust that we've had. That's great. Uh, Nick, I wanna make another question. Yeah. When they say that we're going to open with 25 or 30 or 50 percent capacity, the, some of the concerns of my clients is that how are you going to have 50 percent capacity when you have to be six feet apart? So yeah. immediately the 50 percent capacity is going to 30 percent capacity or in other places yeah. to 25 percent capacity. It's, it's, it's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, uh, I probably, you know, I, I don't know if, if, if Nick or Steve, you know, what you've, what you've seen in your experience on, on how you measure that. Um, I mean, I, I will say, I actually, I, Nick, I kind of agree with you. I, I think there's going to be a lot of people in the city and in New Jersey, because they haven't had indoor dining for a long time now, who are going to be reluctant to sit indoors, um, regardless of whether it's available or not. I think, it's probably still helpful though for the rest to at least allow it because people need to get used to it again. It's going to take time. Yeah. The longer we, we postpone it, it's just going to make it harder and harder to get people to actually dine indoors again. I know, uh, you know, out in Long Island where it's been more, um, in Long Island, there seems to be a lot of, a lot of people dining indoors. Now it's not hundred percent capacity or 50 or whatever it is, but it's more than you would probably think being in New Jersey, like I am where, no one's been eating indoors for six months. And it seems like you, you're scared to even think about it because it's a lot of it's psychology, I think. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. Something that um, the British have done to great effect recently is uh, a new program that gives a 50% discount on certain days to the general public up to a certain amount to encourage them to go to their local restaurants and support them. Uh, I think with the main purpose of creating that habit creation, that memory of reward, which uh, triggers action and um, creates that psychological commitment and reinforcement. So that's something that um, they've been implementing to great uh, success uh, in the UK that may be something we can apply on a federal or state level here. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think something like that would be helpful. Um, and maybe that's going to be part of that Restaurant Act, whatever... You know, if it ever gets passed. Um, I guess on a similar note, you know, we talked about the government, you know, another factor here, one of the biggest expenses for any restaurant is rent. You know, Steve, I mean, what, how have landlords, you know, been, been with, with you so far? And we can, you know, Nick and others can, can chime in. I mean, have they been I, cooperative? I, I, mean, I, I can tell you that what I've heard both from through my, my our law firm's clients and just anecdotally is that to the extent you can even get an agreement with a landlord, 
the most they'll do usually is just defer the rent rather than forgive anything. Um, and a lot of times, and so that what, it, what you end up hap- what ends up happening is you're essentially borrowing against the amount that you haven't paid. Right. Uh, and you know, at some point that's not sustainable for a lot of these businesses, even if you get that relief. Well, a business that used to be years ago, a 30% margin business, um, and then of distant memory became a 20% margin business. Um, yeah. And right before COVID was, was hovering on a good day around 10%, um, no longer allows you to make an, uh, a living and pay deferred rents. Um, I decided early on because of the number of locations, 33, that I wasn't gonna accept any deferrals. Um, and I haven't wavered from that. Yeah. Uh, a lot of landlords that got angry and, and didn't accept the reality uh, have come back to the negotiating table and, and now they're talking um, abatement and not deferral. Um, and that's probably the reason why I will end up walking away from several deals, several locations, uh, because landlords just don't accept the new reality. Um, I've only signed a few agreements, to be honest with you, because I haven't seen improvement. I, I've been close to signing many times, mm-hmm. and I just continually see the, the delay, the lag uh, in things shaping up. So I've used now the, the holiday coming up, the, the Labor Day holiday, as, as an excuse. I've been using it for about a month. Um, and ironically, even some landlords that were on the fence and, and weren't quick to, uh, to, to sign the agreements uh, themselves now have said, okay, why don't we wait until after Labor Day to see where things settle? Um, I'm not overly optimistic or, or greatly optimistic or, or optimistic, period, as yeah. to what we'll see. Um, several of those deals will go unsigned simply because both sides don't want to take the, uh, the first step. Um, just as a point of education for, for our, uh, our fellow restaurateurs, um, I've served lease cancellation notices to most of my landlords. Um, and I believe my attorney has told me that a lease cancellation can be withdrawn up to the last day. So now I've got about a dozen of rolling lease cancellations where I was supposed to vacate at the end of May. I resent the notice so it becomes the end of September. And I'll continue to do that to to use the legal aspect to to my advantage where I can. Because certainly if and when the time comes and, and landlords, New York City landlords get a chance, I'm sure they'll use the legal justice system to their advantage as well. So I'm, I'm playing a little bit cute. I'm, I'm deferring as much as I can. Um, and I'm not quick to make any decisions. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's, it's interesting because, you know, you would think the landlords would sort of see what, you know, reality in front of them. And um, I think some do, but, you know, from their perspective, the the ones that do, Nick, I'm sorry to cut you off, are the yeah, ones yeah. that have vacant space and they right. don't have uh, Nick Livanos or Steve Tenedios as a, <laughs> uh, a guarantor on a good guy guarantee. Right, um, right. Yeah, and, no. And, look, unfortunately, I, the ones that have us don't want to let us go. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, 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 um, it's difficult. And look, I've heard from landlords who will say, look, we have real, you know, we have real estate taxes and, and, uh, um, but that doesn't excuse, you know, seeing the reality of what the restaurants are going through. I think there's also the other thing I've heard is that, you know, they don't know what some landlords, they don't want to, um, you know, forgive rent and then have the government step in and, uh, and, uh, and like another PPP loan, for example, tech program, where now they've, they've essentially left money on the table. And so some landlords have been kind of agreeing to certain things, but only for a limited period of time. Um, so there's a lot of ways that people have been trying to handle it, but for the most part, it just seems like it's, an, it's just a mess where you know everyone's been left to try to negotiate or not negotiate a deal. Um, no one can be evicted as of yet. And um, 
it's uh, everything's been sort of the can's been kicked down the road and, you know, we'll see what's going to happen in the future. I mean, Nick, I don't know what your experience has been with all of this. Um, or except for one landlord, they have shown a willingness to want to, to assist us. So we, we've, we've, I feel okay. Um, they don't want to commit really beyond the year. They, 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 they do have a wait and see. Yeah. But they, they don't, they, they don't want to lose us as tenants. And we happen to have uh, the right type of landlords. They're very big landlords, very uh, wealthy landlords, and they're not REITs. I'm, I'm not in any, uh, I don't have a, um, yeah. a landlord that's a REIT. I yeah. think they, those, our type of landlords do treat you a little differently and more on a case by case basis instead of treating everyone as one big basket and the same rules for everyone. Yeah. So uh, I, it's, it's, it's been friendly and, and cooperative for the most part. I mentioned my landlord at 1700 Broadway that uh, was not at all. So you have to make a quick decision and surrender the keys because why, why hemorrhage money? Why, you know, cut your losses when you can. So that's yeah. what we did in that, in that situation. But. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, the REITs have been more difficult. Um, and they, they really just lump everyone together. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a little bit more difficult to deal with. I mean, I just to tell you, you mentioned, so in Astoria, I mean, sim, you're seeing similar things there? So mainly the customer that I have in the city, they're in a big uh, trouble. Yeah. The customer that I have outside the city, Astoria, the Bronx, not mainly in the Bronx, but in uh, Brooklyn, Williamsburg, or in Long Island, they have been doing very, very, very good. Especially with the outside dining, the store that they have, a corner store, like they're booming. But uh, my main concern are for the customers that I have in the city, especially in the Midtown. Uh, for example, as uh, Mr. Tenedios uh, mentioned, most of his restaurants, they are in Midtown. Even that we go with the best scenario that tomorrow they open and they give us money and everything. If the people, they don't return back to the city to work from the offices, what's going to happen there with the fine dining or, you know, with the, the catering places? That's something that I have been asking um, a lot my, myself. Because I had uh, some customers in the city that they have some huge rent. They are not operating, but um, how are they going to survive if they reopen again when the city is empty? But uh, beside that, um, I think outside of New York City, like when I say outside of, outside of Manhattan, it has been really good for everybody. Especially in Queens. In Astoria, it's booming. Like all the cafes are, you know, full of people, the restaurant, everything. Yeah. Yeah. New, Manhattan's difficult right now. I know that, um, you know, it's, it's unlikely. Unfortunately, it's Labor Day is coming up, but I don't think anyone really expects many of, in, in the Midtown area, for example, you have a lot of businesses and, and major companies. I don't think you can expect any, any of the most major companies to be um, uh, requiring their employees to come back to the city after Labor Day or anytime soon. Um, I mean, it's, it's unclear when, but I, you know, it's certainly not going to be at the earliest, maybe it would be in October, but the problem is if it doesn't happen by October, November, you can very easily see this going into next year. And that's the scary proposition for restaurants in Manhattan. Um, it will, it will go into next year from, from the standpoint of lack of tourism. Uh, yes. My, my quick casual and certainly mixed restaurants depended on a certain, to a certain degree on the tourists that were in New York City. You know, the yes. published numbers are 67 million in 2019. We're not coming anywhere near that in 20, and I don't think 21 is going to be much better than 20. So we really have our challenges, no matter what happens to the corporate environment, Right. I don't think they'll possibly make up in Midtown. I'm referring to now. I don't think it could possibly make up for the the lost tourism. Yeah, Steve, you're absolutely right. I didn't even think I, I didn't even think about the tourism right now. But yes, I mean, the, the, we're not going to be seeing that for a long time um, yeah. until people are, are feel safe. 
and the reputation that the United States has right now outside, you know, to Europeans and to Asians is not very good as it relates to, to COVID, unfortunately. Um, I mean, you, you mentioned the, the fast casual. I mean, do you think if and when we ever have a recovery, um, do you think that the, the fast casual um, type stores are going to recover faster than the sort of the upscale restaurant? I, I think um, Nick touched on it a little bit before with his um, stray dog vodka or gin. Yeah, I think gin. we're all gin. Yeah, we all we all need whoever's going to survive needs to a certain degree to reinvent themselves, um, yeah. and that reinvention can come through a lot of different areas or, or ways. You know, one is the gin that uh, Nick was referring to. Another word, another way is the reduction, the resetting of rents. You know, commercial rents will not be anytime soon what they were. So if 10, 12% was, was the previous norm, uh, we could find ourselves through reduced competition because we're certainly gonna have a lot less competition, Nick and I, in, uh, in Midtown. Mm -hmm. uh, through redu reduced competition, we might hit previous numbers or approach them, even though we're lacking tourists. Um, and this is the hopeful side of me now that by keeping our costs low and, and the resetting of, uh, of the real estate, you know, we might find ourselves two, three years from now in a better position. Um, I'll keep praying for that. And, and I hope the rest of my restaurant community does the same, but, but a lot has to change between now and then it's, uh, it's not going to be a single thing. It's not going to be the corporates only. It's not going to be the, um, the tourists only. Nothing is going to go back to what it was. Whoever's yeah. going to survive really has to find a, a new approach. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, in, um, I was quoted in Barron's, and it echoed what I wrote to the governor, that restaurants have to start to open in order for everyone else to follow. If restaurants start to open, then office workers will start to take that as a good sign and start returning back to work, albeit a, an abbreviated schedule. But most companies want their employees to come back. It, it might be only, it may only be two or three days a week. So if that starts to happen, and if restaurants can take the lead, that's what we have to keep emphasizing to our, our, our leaders, uh, yeah. to, to everyone in office, that you got to let us open. So then the confidence will start to return to New York and every other business will start to follow. But if, if they keep treating us like we're going to be at the um, that we're going to accelerate the pandemic. That's ridiculous. Uh, we, yeah. we know how to run our businesses. We could manage our interiors. Mm -hmm. why, why do you, why, you know, it's, 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 well, you know, it's interesting. So I was actually in my office in Manhattan last week and I actually, and, and I'd say most of the restaurants, I'm in lower Manhattan, most of the restaurants were closed. And I actually thought even if we wanted to bring our staff back, we couldn't because where would they go eat? Um, why do you think that they've kept, I mean, why do you think they haven't allowed indoor dining in Manhattan up until now? Because it doesn't, it doesn't really make sense. I mean, gyms are about to open. Right. Who, who wants to be near someone that's breathing heavy and sweating? I mean, we, uh, we've been able to, um, I forgot who said it earlier, we, that you're allowed to open up at 50%, but then it won't really be 50%, it'll be 40% or 35%. Mm -hmm. you, you'll figure it out. You'll be able to space everyone. Right. Uh, and, and except for the smallest of restaurants, they're going to be the most challenged. But I really don't know why they're not allowing us to, to, to open this. And then I'm worried if schools uh, do really bad in their openings, the way some of the colleges have, they're never gonna let us open. Yeah. Also inconsistent with respect to the approach, for example, in Westchester County versus New York City. So you can cross over to Westchester and be able to be seated inside, or you can go to the gym that Nick mentioned. Um, but it seems like um, there's a separate standard for restaurants, which which probably is not terribly scientific. So there there have been uh, articles about uh, ventilation and air circulation and and how how that is uh, refreshed, but 
if if you give the operators the ability to open and give them the appropriate guidelines in accordance with with the scientific requirements, I think you'll see them be able to to strive to to meet those requirements. Alex, I'm glad you mentioned um, you just triggered a thought. We started with the modern barn, and we hopefully will do it in all the restaurants. We put a, a, a new filtration ionizing system that that will will give the customer a little more confidence of, of not being uh, of less contagions in the air that could be passed on to other people. So we, we have taken those steps. Uh, for, for, for a four or $5,000 investment, it might be uh, well worth upgrading uh, our ventilation systems to give the public more confidence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um. So, you know, the, the other thing I think that um, a lot of restaurants have been dealing with, and maybe more so the ones that serve alcohol, is trying to balance, you know, sort of the legal compliance with, uh, and, and sort of health, health compliance with customer service. So we've heard about restaurants getting in trouble because they weren't making sure everything was properly socially distanced, or there's crowds outside of the restaurant or bar, or, um, you know, customers aren't wearing masks. I mean, how do you deal with that on, on a day-to-day -day basis at, at, at your locations? I mean, it must be difficult because, it, you know, you can't, you're not the police. It's not like you can force someone to wear a mask or, or not wear a mask, for example. I mean, how, how have you dealt with that? I think the restaurants that got in trouble are the restaurants where there are several operations on one block and the, the outdoor, outdoor in the streets, it became a little bit of a festival. Yeah, I think I, there was, I think, on Steinway in Astoria that happened. It's happened downtown in, in, the, um, in the East Village. We haven't had a problem. Uh, the, the, this is the, the new reality, and our customers are used to it. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's wherever there's high density of operations with outdoor spaces, they're the ones that have had uh, a greater difficulty. So with all, with all that said, I mean, what can we take any good out of all this? I mean, Steve, you, you mentioned a couple of things that may change for the better. Um, you know, uh, when all is said and done, um, you know, are we, will there be anything that we take away from all this that might improve the business, whether it's, uh, you know, maybe there's more outdoor dining, maybe there's more automation. Um, what, what do you, what do you see kind of, coming out of all this well there is a silver lining um we just don't know what it is yet and and how it's going to present itself I, yeah. I think it'll be a combination of factors you know it starts with the labor pool prior to covid we were very challenged there's lots of employees um i believe post um ppp when the, uh, the time limits run out, you're going to see a lot of restaurants, another wave of restaurant closures. And, and certainly being in the business, I don't wish that on anybody. Um, but the environment here in New York City was rife. And it was a recipe for disaster, what's happened the last five, ten years. Uh, between the, the labor pool, the labor costs, um, the, the left-leaning government the escalating rents, something had to give. Um, I'm sorry that it was COVID. We certainly could have faced these challenges differently, um, but COVID really hit the brakes on, on everything. And it's gonna reset a lot of what we were experiencing, the challenges uh, in the near future could very well be to our advantage. Um, and if you take a little bit from each pile, or, or each category, all of that could well add up to something better for us that, that are able to ride out the storm. Um, it's a little premature, but I'm, I'm thinking already what the next leg up will be. Um, I'm very tempted with the opportunities that are being presented, um, and I'm actually holding back because I think that will only continue to increase. There'll be even better opportunities and cheaper rents um, and pre-built spaces that, that probably operators like myself and like Nick and, and a lot of others 
will be able to step into with a, a lesser investment and a greater return. The, it's New York City. We're not going to fall off the map. It might take a little longer and be a little more painful than any of us would like, but uh, I want to believe that it'll come back eventually. What we're seeing is we, we have about 34,000 customers across the U.S. and Canada. And so in terms of things that we're seeing at a macro level, we're seeing new delivery trends, designated pickup areas, uh, mobile menus, online engagement, celebrations to go, creative seating. So from, the, from our perspective, I think these are probably things that are here to stay. And then the other thing we're seeing as distributors are new lines of business. So we're, we're, we've established a new B2C platform uh, where we're going direct to consumers and, and I'm sure we're going to uh, continue to work on that like many other companies in our industry. So I think the, the engagement will get more uh, tech uh, heavy and, um, and certainly a huge emphasis on safety. So, you know, we're seeing also, you know, high touch areas being focused on uh, mask gloves, social distancing being implemented and, uh, and signs to show uh, what is sanitized and how often. And then in the operations, we're, um, we're seeing a lot of um, uh, improvements across the board in how uh, we interface both with our customers and with our operations, taking into account the unique COVID situation. And one of the things that um, I have seen also from uh, a distributor perspective is that... Um, the customers that they are doing now business, they know what they are doing. Um, I have a lot of customers that actually they are paying. They don't want to carry any balances. Like uh, by the end of the week, they want to pay everything. So they have clear what, uh, you know, how much money they're going to be taking home. Instead, before of COVID that, you know, everybody was asking for 15, 20 days credit. Now, most of the customer talking from my behalf, I don't know, maybe... Mr. Alex can uh, talk to me about that. They want to pay. Like every Friday, you know, everybody want uh, to have clean his book, no balances, nothing. So it's uh, like um, the path is clearing for the people that they know what they are doing in that business, in the restaurant business. As well, new ideas are coming, new menus, a lot of uh, pop-up kitchen. They're coming in restaurant that, uh, you know, they don't use it. So it's... Uh, it's changing, and I think that's changing for the better. Yeah. Um, I think on that note, maybe, uh, Alexandra, maybe we open it up to questions from the audience. Okay. I'm unmuting everyone. Well, maybe, um, should we go one at a time, maybe, rather than... Whichever you prefer. If we unmute everyone, it might get... We might get chaotic. You can all raise your people. hand when you have a question. Yes. Why don't we, I think I saw Athos right now. Yeah, <clears throat> yes. Um, Athos Iwano. Thank you, Nick. Uh, first, I'd like to, on behalf of the chamber, thank everybody, all the panelists for participating today. I, I know you're all extremely busy and you were gracious enough to spend a lot of time with us and uh, provide a lot of great information. We really appreciate it. My question is about political advocacy. And um, Nick Livanos mentioned that he has contacted the governor. And I was wondering if you are involved in any, uh, whether individually or through trade groups or other organizations, any advocacy to lobby the government to change their position on the, on the situation, on the reopening, on the issue of capacity. And if you have, uh, what is the, what's been the response? Is there any, uh, is there, was there a positive reception? I know it's a very politically uh, a messy situation for uh, the government. And I uh, was just wondering what, yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, now, Alexandra, I think you can 
unmute the, the yes, panel. Yeah. Um, the New York City Hospitality Alliance, I I find is our has become a top advocate for for New York City and its operators. They they've had successes and they've become a, a very strong voice for the restaurant industry. So I, I'm a member and I would um, recommend all restaurateurs to join them. Um, I find I have found them. There's other you know there's other rest uh, restaurant lobby groups, but right now Andrew Riggi the president of uh, New York City Hospitality Alliance, uh, they're, they're excellent. So it's important to support um, these organizations. Thank you. Thank you. A any other questions? Uh, Athos, we're, we're also um, with IFTA uh, reaching out on a bipartisan basis. So it's not just uh, one party, but both parties. and. Um, we have found sponsors uh, in both parties to uh, proceed with uh, proposed legislation. So we're cautiously optimistic, but uh, our, our efforts are bipartisan. Interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have any, if someone else has a question, can you raise your hand? <laughs> Alexander, um, you see Fanny Stamsuris, can you unmute him? No jokes, Fanny. He's still on mute. Yes, I'm taking him off now. Very oh. fast on mute. Put, put, put a three second delay on Fanny, please. I've tried to unmute. He has to press the. Um... I Put him on a three second delay, just in case we have to filter. You will have to press the unmute button that I've sent you. There you okay, go. Okay, there you are, Mr. All right. Yeah, I'll try to keep it uh, not as funny, Steve. I know this is serious. Uh, hello, Nick, and uh, everybody else in the group. Uh, Steve, Mr. Livanos, appreciate the, the uh, insight in all the that you've uh, given. I think it's very helpful and uh, very educational. Uh, I have one question which lingers on my mind, which is I, I, I also am in New York City. I own four diners, which are decimated, about 80% down. Uh, pretty, pretty soon I'm going to own three of them. Uh, one has gone the way out. But uh, how is it? I know how New Jersey is, where I live in New Jersey. Uh, the rest of the states, the restaurants compared to the, the rest of the states compared to what New York is, or I can, I don't know, Manhattan is very decimated. Uh, I know they are out of boroughs and not as bad, but how are the rest of the restaurants in the country are doing? Not the fast food ones, the, in the same sector of the world. If I could answer, um, I, I, we have two restaurants in Westchester and we have been operating at about 40, 45% of our normal sales. The one thing I haven't mentioned yet, uh, the, one, the one area that we have reinvented ourselves a little bit is our delivery is much, much stronger and, uh, and pick up. So we've always done that on a smaller scale, but because families are staying home and not going out and um, because a restaurant like the Modern Barn, which is a little more higher end, finer dining, we're getting those $100, $200 uh, takeout uh, orders uh, uh, every day. So that's something we've learned from and we want to hold on to. We don't want that to leave us. But otherwise, um, it's just slightly better because we have indoor dining, uh, but not much better. Uh, I, I appreciate the answer. Uh, and. Uh... I know your business is actually I'm a customer at the Modern Barn. I go one hour of my way to go to the Modern Barn. <laughs> even though I live in New Jersey, it's one of the better places that I like. Uh, <laughs> great, I've been hopeful everybody does well. Uh, I was thinking more national uh, than the, than the tri-state, if anybody knows what's I'll, national. Alex could, in. Alex could comment on that from Darien. Yeah. Could, could you repeat, please? 
how, yeah. how, how do you know how um, the restaurant industry has been impacted nationally as compared to the tri-state area? Are they, is it the same? Is it less? Have they been hit less than tri-state area has been impacted? Yeah, I mean the the um, the lockdown. So the industry has been impacted through no fault of its own based on the, um, you know, shutdowns and, and the mandates. So we've seen that um, across, across the U.S., of course, in areas like the coast in California and New York with the most densely populated areas you see in, in the, the more strict measures, you see an even larger impact for sure. But we've seen forced lockdowns in Miami and D.C. and New York and California and Illinois, et cetera. So we, we've, we've seen severe impact across, uh, across the U.S. So hopefully the, um, you know, the, you know, with, um, you know, the, hopefully the winter's mild and, and uh, outdoor dining is available in certain other parts of the country to lessen the impact on national businesses like ours. But um, it seems like it's been a, a challenge. So we're, um, Bill Gates recently, uh, I think last week, uh, basically felt that this should be behind us by the mid to end of next year on a combination of a vaccine, effective therapeutics, um, herd immunity, and um, in general population um, sort of, um, uh, get, you know, being more, more comfortable with all of these things and, and these being developed. So uh, while the present looks challenging and to Steve's point earlier, uh, maybe the winter looks uh, difficult, we're, we're optimistic in the, in the medium term. Mm, um, I think the next question is from uh, John of mm -hmm. Hi, Nick. Thank you Hi. all to the guests who have uh, provided many great insights on this, these topics. You know, naturally as a Greek American, I have a few members of my family who have restaurants and diners. And a lot of them have been asking in terms of strategy, what the best way to approach their la respective landlords and to ask for, as one uh, panelist said, an, an abatement. So, I mean, does anyone have experience in these types of negotiations? I know that the, land, the landlords are often taking a wait and see approach. Uh, likewise, I think on the part of the, the tenants, on the restaurant owners, they're also trying to take on a wait and see approach to see, you know, what type of rent would be reasonable to give for the year. Is there, for example, arrangements that you've seen like based on gross revenues or um, do you think it's better to negotiate upfront or to wait until after, for example, summer season to try to negotiate with the landlord? maybe there's less bargaining power at that time. So that's my question. I'll take that on. Mm -hmm. I think the sooner you start negotiating, the better mm -hmm. off you are. Mm -hmm. um, and like everything else, the more you negotiate, the better you get at it. Mm -hmm. um, and like everything else in life, don't be shy mm -hmm. in, in mm -hmm. order to, um, in order to succeed in negotiating, I believe that to get what you're ultimately looking to get, especially mm -hmm. with a, uh, a New York City or a New York State landlord, mm -hmm. um, ask for the sky, the sun, the moon, <laughs> in, in, in order to settle for something much less. Mm -hmm. um, this isn't a time to be shy. A lot of people's livelihood and, and futures are, are dependent on this. Mm -hmm. um, don't be shy to the point of changing your mind. You know, um, if, if you get too quick of a response, it probably means that you asked for too little. Um, I'm, I, in particular, am asking for percentage deals uh, based on sales. I've shared previous year's tax returns, um, and I'm asking for three months consecutive numbers from last year, from 19. I'm going forward to use 19 numbers as a demarcation point when to go back to the original rent. My mm -hmm. belief is that in most instances, I, I probably won't see those numbers again, uh, which works to my advantage. From a landlord standpoint, um, 
it's kind of reassuring to see what sales your tenant was doing before, which were pretty healthy. Um, and to have that hope and expectation that, you know, this is how I'll get to baseline. Landlords are not stupid people. They didn't get to where they are, uh, most of them at least, by being <laughs> stupid. Um, so they're hoping the same thing we're hoping, and that is that things come back to a baseline. Um, the ones that haven't realized that the market has, has reset itself already and will probably continue to decline as, as long as the, the, the herd mentality hasn't shifted, I, I think le rents will go lower, not higher in the near term. So you could certainly use that to your advantage when you're negotiating. Um, I, if I could sum it up in, in one sentence, I, I think that would be, don't be shy. Don't overcommit. Ask for a lot so you get something that you can live with. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, Aristoteles, you wanted to add something? Yeah. Um, from what I see, it's a lot of people that uh, they own restaurant. And I want to say that from um, the sales perspective, it's always good to listen to your sales representative uh, for whoever he, he works because uh, I feel that we are the ultimate source of information. Uh, we are the one that uh, we are walking every day up and down the street, driving in Lock Island, seeing different things. So um, your sales representative can help you a lot uh, in uh, new ideas, in new menu, in menu costing. And also um, we, like Victory, we have been coming with a lot of new product that um, have been help have him helping a lot uh, the customer, especially for uh, the to-go orders. Because as Mr. Nick Livano said, the delivery is growing every day more and more. So a lot of the customers, they don't want to leave. They don't want to lose that when they reopen again. So mainly it's like, listen to your sales representative. You know, like uh, we are outside, like we're coming with new ideas. It doesn't mean if I work in Victory, Cisco, Dairyland, like uh, we are the source. Um, <clears throat> I think the next question comes from uh, Penelope Sammons, who's representing our uh, Chambers Florida chapter. Oh, hello. Actually, I, I, I typed it. it. And it is a one a question that I pose, even though I don't, um, I'm not of this industry sector. I posed it because I've observed um, a, a couple of trends. Uh, hospital chains uh, uh, traditionally have had very bad food and I have seen, because I used to, to be a principal with IBM in healthcare, and I have seen where um, it was turned around when a uh, large restaurant chain assumed the cafeteria and the meal preparation. And I think with the help of dietitian, um, we can, uh, especially Greek restaurants, um, can really implement uh, the old attaché, let thy food be thy medicine. And, and, and so the other trend I have noticed, I have some elderly friends who are in assisted living and there's a plethora, I'm in Florida, there's a plethora of assisted living places and the food menu is abysmal. I mean, it's delicious to satisfy their client, but um, it is terribly unhealthy. And it, if anything, it probably contributes to inflammation and, and um, weakens someone in their ability to fight infection. And I think that may be perhaps a strategy that can be deployed, uh, explored, and and leveraged. Is that, I mean, Ale Alexandros Aldous has, I mean, it sounds like you, you're very gung-ho about new strategies. Is this one that perhaps you have contemplated? Uh, when you say new strategies, do you mean in terms of so, so I, I think our, our clientele is primarily 
uh, menu driven independent restaurants. Okay. And so our, our focus is on uh, the type of high quality products and approach that I think you're advocating for. So anything that expands the opportunity for um, high quality um, specialty uh, products, I think is something that we would, we would think is a great idea. And, um, you know, restaurants like um, Nick, Nick's, uh, you know, clearly have that approach. So I, I think it's probably um, for the segment of cafeterias and nursing home, it's probably uh, there, you, there would need to be a need to allocate more resources to the supply chain to get better products, but certainly the expertise uh, exists from sales forces like Aristoteles was talking about to provide uh, great um, insight and also the distribution channels do exist to improve the quality of what, um, what you're seeing on the ground. And so, so this certainly could be an opportunity for a pivot like that. Is that responsive to your question? Yes, thank you. All right, I think the last question is due to time is from uh, John Marcos. John, are you there? I'll, I guess I'll read it, um, and anyone, if they want to um, uh, respond to this, he asks, is the industry doing enough to try to work with politicians with respect to taxes, crime, um, police, et cetera? Um, this may be more relevant to Manhattan than other areas, but uh, Steve, Nick, do you have any input on this? Um, I'll take this. Um, Nick mentioned before the Hospitality Alliance. Um, I'm a founding member, actually, myself and, and five other individuals. Eight, nine years ago, we started the Alliance uh, as a way of having a voice and uh, power that the New York State Restaurant Association couldn't give us. I think this is a prime opportunity for anyone that isn't part of the Alliance to, to really write the name down, Google it, research it. It's very difficult for a, a, an individual or a chain to make a difference, especially with, with the bipartisan and, and the political, uh, the current political environment we're in. Um, it's taken eight long years for the Alliance to really get traction and, and be as, um, as effective as they have become. It's good to have somebody advocating for our industry. Uh, it was very late in coming. Um, and they've done a terrific job. Anybody that, that'll, that wants to Google or research and see what the Alliance is about, um, it's, it's a terrific opportunity, A, to join, B, to support, um, and C, to realize what's being done when a lot of us are, uh, are either sleeping or, or a little indifferent. You know, things have changed enough now that, that we can't, we can no longer be indifferent. Um, and this is a great organization to, to represent our industry, the hospitality industry. Uh, I guess, Mr. Kafitsa, did you, did you want to add something? I see you had a comment relating to this question. Yes. Um, like uh, Mr. Danelio said, the uh, New York Hospitality Alliance is uh, an organization that uh, one may find plenty of answers uh, while operating on a daily basis, uh, especially in uh, matters of law and other uh, agendas that uh, are being uh, supported by the Alliance. Um, on the national level, uh, we have the uh, uh, National Restaurant Association that uh, helps uh, local governments um, of uh, restaurant associations to, uh, to support uh, their agenda as well. Um, in, cert in certain states, the Pan Gregorian organization has uh, lobbied strongly uh, with uh, various proposals and with uh, our allies and partners nationwide, we help through consulting and through uh, various programs 
to um, help the individual restaurateur, the one that uh, cannot implement um, economies of scale or uh, franchise economies uh, to be able to be heard. Uh, but uh, as far as uh, the New York State is concerned, as far as New York City uh, is an answer to uh, the participant, the uh, Andrew Ridgey, that I know personally of, and of course, Mr. Tanedio says the uh, founder of this organization have been doing a fantastic job. And I think uh, I also recommend that anyone who has the need or even if they don't think they do to join, now is the time. Great. Okay, great. Um, I mean, I think as a, you know, think, I mean, I think this has been a great panel, a great discussion. I hope everyone's found this to be as interesting as um, I have. Um, I think the takeaway from all this, as far as I'm concerned, is that we should all appeal to our local politicians to help the restaurant industry. Um, I think sometimes, the re I think, not sometimes, I think the restaurant industry has been taken for granted because even though, like Nick and Steve and, and, and others have described, I mean, we've, you know, we, we have di different people involved in different organizations. For the most part, the restaurant industry has done exactly what they've been asked to do in order to fight you know, the pandemic. And I think they've been taken for granted to some degree. And so, you know, reaching out to your politicians is important and, and frankly, just supporting our local restaurants, whether you know, in, in, in your community, your city, your town, um, it's really important. Um, you know, it's important for the communities we live in, the communities we work in, uh, and it's important for the, the families, the you know, small business owners who own these restaurants and whose livelihoods are tied to these businesses. Um, so with that, I wanna thank everybody. Um, and um, this has been great. And Marcos, I will just, um, I guess I'll just, is there anything else we want to uh, convey to, to the group here before we, we sign off? Well, I just want to extend my, my gratitude to everyone for participating. Um, and I, I figure since I have a bit of a captive audience, I, I just wanted to mention uh, we launched our first part of a four-part wine series. Uh, the first part was called Summer Lovers. Uh, we started off with the, uh, the islands um, and we learned all about winemaking on the islands. And we have three more parts where we're going to tour the rest of Greece. And it's, it's a lot of fun. And along the way, we get to meet a lot of the winemakers and they talk about uh, how they harvest um, and how they make their wines. And it's really spectacular. Uh, and what's nice is uh, when they join us, uh, you get to see the vineyards and, um, you know, where they grow the, the, the grapes and make the wine. And it's really wonderful, informative event. So on that note, thank you guys. And I'll turn it back uh, to you, Nick. Thank you. All right. Well, I, I'm done here. Thanks uh, to our panelists. Thanks to our sponsors. Thanks to the audience. Have a great day.